Welcome, bienvenue, willkommen y bienvenidos a la tercera temporada de Parte y Destacate. Yo soy tu anfitriona, Nikki Green. Welcome back to season three of Stand Up and Stand Out. I'm your host, Nikki Green, and we are kicking off an amazing new season filled with some incredible guests. Stand Up and Stand Out is a podcast for those leaving university and heading into the work world. We help those in transition find their purpose so they can enjoy their career without sacrificing their lives. Following nearly two decades working in Fortune 500 companies, I want to share my leadership learnings with all of you. Thought leaders are needed in all walks of life, not just business. And we're in a critical time to pivot ourselves and the community around us to build a better future together. This show is the start of your beyond college journey to help you answer the question, I graduated, now what? Let's get ready to listen in to the next episode. Welcome back to Stand Up and Stand Out, everyone. So excited for today's guest, which is Stephanie Haynes. She is an education coach, a consultant specializing in equipping all stakeholders to support teens as they develop plans for a future after high school on their own terms. With 30 years in education as a public homeschool, and charter school teacher, professional coaching certifications, and experience as the mom of two young adults. She has unique insights into the teenage post-high school planning process. Her goal is to create a cultural revolution where all post-high school training and education opportunities are championed equally, all careers are valued equally, and the potential of all teens to succeed is paramount in the education process. Thanks so much for joining us, Stephanie. How are you doing today? I am good. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you for having me today. Awesome. And unfortunately, even though I've been sick for the past few weeks, the benefit was I had plenty of time to read your amazing book, College Is Not Mandatory. And I absolutely loved it. There was so many great aspects of it. And I can't wait for you to talk about this and so much more with our audience. (laughs) Thank you. So as we kick things off, I always like to give everyone the stage first. And let's Tell our audience a little bit about you, your journey, and of course, your origin story. And let's find out if you are the superhero or the villain in this one. (laughs) I don't know. I like to think of myself as a superhero, but it could depend on the audience of whether or not I was the villain. But, um, you know, as you said in in the intro, I have two kids. I've been married 26 years. We live in Charleston, South Carolina, which is amazing. And I love it. Uh, I grew up in California. And that's my origin story begins, right? If you want to you in the music here. I I ended up, um, I've always wanted to be a teacher. And my first teaching job was at Ignacio Valley High School in California. And after the first couple of years, I figured it all out. I was invited to teach for what's called the Health Partnerships Academy. And that is kind of a school within a school where they take all of these at-risk kids, the ones that all the rest of the teachers think aren't going to be successful, the ones they really don't want in their classroom. And they put them all together in this group and they say, okay, make sure they graduate. And so what I learned in that was, huh, these kids can graduate. They know they, they can be successful, but no one showed them how. And they have a lot of different things going on in their world that prevent them from becoming successful in the traditional mold. So when I broke out of that mold and said, wait, you can be successful. I know you can. And I didn't let them take no for an answer. And I didn't let them, you know, I never took no for an answer from them. They started performing and they rose in aptitude and abilities and skills beyond anybody's expectations to the point now some of our doctors, right? They're huge. And so that was where my origin story started. I recognized that there were a lot of kids that the education system didn't support. And I wanted to make sure that that didn't happen to any other kids anymore, because it's not fair. All kids to be given access to the education that's best for them. And that's what I'm about. I absolutely love that. And and it's so true. And it's a lot of why I spend a lot of time on nonprofit boards and giving back and volunteering is because I saw this as well. I was very fortunate that I had direction from my parents and that was pretty much like, if you don't do something, <laughs> you can't stay here. And so that was really ominous and, and in the background. But the option of what I wanted to do was still up to me. And I have a long history in my family of going into the military. Uh, most of my family worked in education. So, of course, you know, they pushed me in one of those paths. But had I gone to a trade school or done an alternative thing, they still would have been supportive. And I think it's very difficult for kids these days that we're kind of pushing only one agenda and that may not be the right fit for them. Or maybe it's not the right fit right now where they're at. So rest is fantastic. <laughs> That's absolutely true. 
So what about your journey? It makes you unique and what makes you stand out from the rest? You know, one of the things that I find fascinating, because I don't ever think of myself as unique. I kind of feel like I'm just like a regular person. But apparently someone who's been in education for 30 years and a parent and been trained as a coach is kind of a unicorn. Like they don't exist. And I didn't know this because, you know, I figured everybody talks like I know, like to talk and no, they don't. So um, I think that's the biggest thing is that I really have been in education. Actually, I wanted to be a teacher in second grade. So I've been paying attention to education ever since. And as a teacher, I got inside knowledge about education. And as an educator in the early 90s, we saw the transformation of what schools used to be, a training ground for trade and everything else start to become only liberal arts preparatory places, right? Only for college. So I've watched that dichotomy start and change the whole culture that we're living in now. And I raised my own two children in that culture, trying to recognize, okay, how do I help them navigate this well with the whole pressure? And they're absorbing that pressure themselves. And then I know how to talk to parents because I am a parent. I know how to talk to educators because I am an educator. I know how to talk to administrators because I understand the whole process. And that, I think, is one of the best best things is I can talk to anybody within this field and help them understand where everybody else is coming from because I've been there and I've worked with that population and I understand them on all levels. And that tends to help people take a break from what they currently know to be really important and go, oh, wait, oh, I see where you're coming from with there. That makes that makes much more sense. So I think that's one of the biggest things. I think that's incredibly important to be able to bridge those differences in opinion, experience, what they've been told, because things are evolving. And that's what I saw, too, and why I got into my industry of helping young people is I, you know, I worked in tech and we had all these great minds coming to us that were incredibly excited to be there. And skills-based, they were good, but they really struggled with a lot of the basics of interconnecting, of collaborating, of a lot of the soft skills that are really necessary to be successful and to be able to just let yourself go, right? And to figure out how to do things. They had so much uh, helicopter parenting and, you know, people overseeing every single thing that they did and making every decision. When it came to them adulting and and actually doing their own thing, they just didn't know. And and a lot of them, even even though they were good at what they did technically, they didn't actually like it. <laughs> no, they didn't. And, and it's awful, right? You know, you get into this job where you've spent all this time and invested all this energy and this is supposed to be the to-da moment in your life. And you're like, wah, wah, wah. <laughs> like, <it> just... <laughs> exactly. Exactly. More and more people are having that wah, wah moment and the debt on top of that to have to deal with. And that just drives me nuts. So, Yeah, I can imagine. So um, a lot of people have explored different careers. You've done lots of interesting things. So why don't you share a little bit about how your career journey to see, you know, what paths might also be available for people interested in education? Yeah. So within education, there's a ton of things you can do. And if you're listening to this and you're thinking about going into K- into education, I just want to caution you that to figure out what you really want to do. Because if you want to work with kids and change kids' lives, you don't want to be an administrator because you don't get to do it, right? You really don't. That's that's a lot of politics, a lot of parents, it's a lot of drama, and I applaud all of our um, administrators. But the idea here is is that I have been a classroom teacher, and in that, there's a whole bunch of different levels. I've worked with ESL students. I've worked with um, special ed students. I've worked with all of them in the context of being an English teacher. But I've also written curriculum, which is a whole other aspect in education. So let's say you understand a subject or you understand um, just a, a process of something, and you can write how to teach that process. That's what I do. I've written several classes uh, and I've written that curriculum down so that other teachers can use that information to teach for themselves. But I've also been a homeschool educator, which was not on my radar. When my children decided that they wanted to be homeschooled, I said, oh, okay, I guess we're going to do this. And so I learned how to teach in the homeschool world, which is its own unique thing, different places, some people's houses, all kinds of stuff. And then I was actually working in a charter school, which if you're a public school teacher and a charter school teacher, they're very, very different worlds, completely different worlds. So that was a whole different um, entry point for me. But then I was also an author. I've written books before the book that I wrote pre- for currently. I've written other books. I've led a ministry at the church I was at when I was here in 2002, originally. Uh, I developed a whole ministry. I've developed web pages and websites and all that kind of stuff that goes along with it because you know, I didn't have any money to pay anybody. So I've done all that. And then I've been trained as a speaker. So I know how to speak to people of, you know, 10 people or to a thousand people or whatever. I can do all that. And so I'm a speaker as well. 
And then I just added a coaching certification so that I knew how to listen well to people to help them figure out what they wanted. So education is really a massive experience that you can really dive into. It's not just if you want to go into education, you're going to show up as a classroom teacher. It doesn't have to be that way. You can be a corporate educator. You can learn the processes within a system and help those people learn that system. You're saying to yourself that corporations are going, well, they're not coming in with skills. And you're right. Industry is saying they're not coming prepared. So if you understand a skill and you can understand how to teach that, you can work in that industry to orient those new employees. So education comes a lot of ways, but learning how to actually effectively educate people, I think it's a big root of that. So those are all the different careers that I've had. That's amazing. And I love it because, you know, there's a lot of stats saying that 50 percent of the jobs are going to be completely different in just probably five years time from now, that they're going to be jobs we haven't even thought of. And so it's very difficult to even know what we're supposed to be learning and what we're supposed to be doing. And I think education is going to be incredibly increasingly important as we keep sort of stumbling through this and starting to figure it out. And the more people want to be educators and help in all these different aspects, whether that's doing it yourself as a, you know, a coach and a counselor, or whether that's going into one of the established institutions at younger education or higher education, it's it's really going to be critical because we're going to have to keep learning faster and more and and just so many more things in context. And there's going to be tons of niches that probably don't, we don't even know what they are yet. A hundred percent right. I mean, there's the things being, de- being developed through COVID and now after COVID that are still continuing to be developed within education. And it's going to change. It cannot stay the same, not with what we're recognizing now from industry. They're telling us kids are not prepared from university down through high school. It cannot stay the same. It has to change or we're really going to be stuck. I agree. Well, you talked a little bit about writing, so let's talk a little bit about your book, College Is Not Mandatory. I I think it's a really fantastic book and really happy to be able to share it with our audience. Um, I know it's a parent's guide to navigating the options, but I think it's great for kids to read themselves as well. It's very approachable, and it also helps them think through the options. So why don't you talk a little bit about the process of writing and, you know, what inspired you to do this? Yeah, writing is not something I ever set out to do. So if you're sitting out there going, oh, I don't know if I could ever write a book. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you. I don't know how it happened. Except that um, people would ask questions and I wouldn't stop talking. I just couldn't stop talking about it. I would get so upset when my kids and my classroom would come to me and go, well, I can't get into college. I don't know what I'm going to do with my life. I'm like, college is not the only thing you can do, you know. And then I realized people didn't know. Like they had no idea because they'd never been told that there were other options. Not only that, their parents had never been told. So when I'm talking to parents about it, they're like, wait, wait, what is that? I'm like, you don't know? Okay. So I decided that instead of keep talking about it, I was going to write it down because that would be the best way to reach an audience bigger than what I could do one-on-one. And so I wanted to give people the background because they didn't know. Really, education was designed in one respect to help kids prepare for trades. That was what original high school was all about. It wasn't just one track. And then when the university decided they wanted something better, because industry was saying they wanted college degrees for whatever reason, everything shifted. And now we have what we have, right, which is an an, an uneven scale. So, But when I was writing about that, I thought, well, I know about this, but people don't know about the options. And it's not just my opinion. I wanted to include in that book research that's out there about the differences of every option, including financial investment, time investment, skills, payoff, all of that. But I also wanted to interview people, their parents and their students who had gone through and made the choice for that particular option. And I include those interviews in the book because I want people to know there are multiple voices from different perspectives and different family dynamics that are choosing the same options. For example, a lot of students were choosing the apprenticeship option. And that surprised me because they have to give up a lot. But at the same time, they're getting paid to do the work they're getting trained to do in the industry they want to be in in real time. And they're getting offered jobs in those communities or those companies afterwards. No college degree needed, but if they wanted to, those companies are paying for that degree. So it's insane to think about that. You think about the military. Most people think, oh my gosh, front lines. I'm not sending my kid off to be shot off. And I get that, but that's only one career avenue within any branch of the military. There are literally hundreds more that don't require that. And if you do something like the National Reserve or National Guard or Army Reserve, you're working one weekend a month while they pay for you to go to school. And by the time you're done, you can defer the last two years to be as needed and you're done. And you've gotten your, co- your high school paid, excuse me, your college paid for, and you can start this at 17. And you have veterans benefits for life. I don't understand why people aren't exploring all this. And it doesn't have to be one way or the other. 
you can combine a whole bunch of different options. And finally, the trades. Oh my goodness, the trades are a massive need right now. Those salaries are skyrocketing. And so you can be trained in 18 months. You can even start as a high school senior and get trained and be done. And then you're self-sufficient. I mean, think about this. The average starting salary right now for someone in the HVAC industry is $59,000 a year. That's a lot of money for two years of training that you probably can pay off if you had to take a loan within the first year versus college loans, which take 10 to 20 years, right? So that's, that's what I was writing about. And in the back part is this whole guide. And because I've been trained as a coach, I know how to ask certain questions. And they're not, you know, stock questions, but they can be. What kinds of questions to make people think? And so I included that in the background relating to each option specifically. But also, if you don't know what your, is important to you, you don't know what to do, where do you start? I created that kind of outline in the book as well. As, you know, think about your values. Think about what your finances are. Think about the timing, what your needs are. Those kinds of things kind of come into play when you're thinking about what you might want to spend your time doing to develop the skills you want. So that's kind of the, the book in a nutshell. I, I love it because in this goes both ways. Like even if people have already maybe started college and they got there and they're like, man, this just isn't for me. It's not the right fit. I think especially with COVID where maybe you had this vision of college where it's like, oh, I'm going to live in a dorm and it's going to be awesome and I'm going to go to parties and it's going to be super social and, and you're that type of person or, you know, you'd be traveling with your sports team or, you know, all these and all that didn't happen that experience you were expecting may have fallen very short of, you know, where you imagined it. And maybe just curriculum wise, like you're just not identifying it. I know I was actually very fortunate to go to community college when I started because it gave me a chance to, at a much lower cost, get all my undergrad stuff done. All of that, you know, stuff that you kind of have to do for your degree, like English and math and all those sciences, get them checked off at, at literally a fraction of the cost and then transfer to a four-year school if that's what you're interested in. But maybe you're like, hey, I actually really like working on cars. I really like doing mechanical things. I want to be a nurse. Like there's so many other trades and things that you can switch over to just because you started it doesn't mean you have to commit to that four years and then potentially a career in something you have no interest in doing. Right. <laughs> right. A hundred percent. You know, and, and you just fight something else too. It, it, depending on where you live, community colleges can actually be free now. Um, where we live in Charleston, the governor has decided that he wants several programs to be given for free that are actually trained certifications and associate's degrees combined. So mm -hmm. you've got to look at what's offered at your local community college. And you also touched on most people want to go away. They want to live in the dorm. They want to have that college experience. And you feel like maybe you might miss out if you don't have that. And I, and I understand that. But really, when you think about it, you're then paying $20,000 or so to live in a dorm and get dorm food and party and go to class. If, if that is okay with you for your values, okay, no judgment. But if that's not okay for you for your values, you might want to rethink that or at least delay it. Get two years of that covered at a community college, most likely for free, if not, like you said, way reduced. 
and then transfer. So when you're there in college, you're a little older, you can handle it better, right? So there's a whole bunch of different things that are playing in there. It really comes down to individuality, but stop and think, and nobody really stops and thinks yet about what is it really I want. Yeah, they get on that auto train. And I know a lot of people, too, and a lot of people in our audience may be sort of first time college graduates or maybe just their parents don't make a ton of money and they need to work while they're going to school. And, you know, if you're already working just to make ends meet, you know, either for your family or for yourself, you know, again, taking on that huge amount of debt and really not experiencing all those things that, you know, are sort of the add ons. It really puts you in a detriment. And I was really glad, again, to stay home and work while I went to school. And it set me ahead because it also gave me apprenticeship type opportunities. So when I got into the workforce, I already had a leg up on what was going on. And it just gives you a whole different mindset. And then it was pretty awesome. I started working in tech. We kind of had reverse roles. I went to California in the beginning. And and. And tech was fun. You know, tech, we had parties and we did stuff. And, you know, and so then I still got some of that fun atmosphere, but I was making a living while I was doing it, not, you know, sort of eating top ramen in between. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And that's the sort of stuff that people don't really think about, that how, you know, how 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 tough is it going to be for you to live that, quote, dream that you think is going to be so much fun? Is it really going to be fun if you're stressed and you have no money to do anything? And is that really what you want to spend your time doing? So that's a good question to start asking yourself. Yeah, exactly. And I think one of the other benefits that I totally did not expect as, um, you know, staying home to go to community college for the first couple of years is it also offered me the opportunity to continue playing sports. And I loved playing volleyball. And so, you know, having the ability to balance work, school and volleyball, it, it gave me, again, a whole nother experience. It gave me a camaraderie of friends that I wouldn't have met if I was just sort of shuttling back and forth to class. Um, and then I ended up becoming a coach. So I started coaching volleyball and stuff and had another income stream on the side, which again was super fun, you know, and and getting to hang out and and mentor young girls. Um, And then my other great opportunity is I got to study abroad. I went away for a summer to go to Paris. I would have never been able to afford that had I been struggling to pay for a four-year university in the beginning. And again, a life-changing experience, which I totally encourage people. uh, You talk about taking a gap year, you know, and people exploring other opportunities. So... (laughs) <laughs> yeah, for sure. I think everybody can take a gap season of some sort and get out of their comfort zone, get out of their community, get out of their country if need be, but get a broader perspective because otherwise you grow up in a tunnel and all you know is what you have experience, and that's probably not fulfilling you as a human being. Yeah, exactly. So um, let's talk a little bit about um, what else makes you stand up? How do you use your superpowers for good? It seems like you're doing a ton of great things already, but I'm sure there's even more behind the scenes. <laughs> yeah, you know, the book is definitely a big part of that, but I cannot stand inequity in education. I, I can't. And I, even in my own school district here where we live, there are schools that are amazing. And then there are schools that haven't been touched in 25 years. I'm like, how does that happen? How does that happen? How are those kids not as valuable as the other kids? What is that all about? And I know there's, you know, money issues, there's taxes and all property tax and all that kind of stuff. Baloney, give me a break. These are all kids. They all deserve the right and the chance to become as successful as they can be and to be taught how to do that for themselves, right? We don't even talk about how teaching kids how to even define what success is for them. We just let the culture around us tell that to them. Well, that's not really a necessarily healthy culture of success right now, right? So that's what really makes me stand up and say, enough, we've got to do something different. To the point of where I wrote a class just recently for one of the schools I was working at, wrote a whole class to help these kids at this particular school become very successful because they didn't know how to become successful. And it was too hard for the academic teacher to be able to teach that. So I wrote the class and we built it so that they would know how to be successful in the high school and then how to build that successful plan after high school. And so it's that kind of stuff that really makes me frustrated when teachers, and I, I love teachers with so no disrespect to teachers because y'all don't have enough time to do anything right now, but teachers don't have enough time to help their kids to find really what success is about. And they don't believe it's their job. They believe it's their job just to teach them their academics, but that's not true. It's, it's just not. And you have a much better experience when you educate the child from who they are and help them learn to be successful in the material rather than make them learn the material the way you want. And so I think that that's a lot of it, too. And it bothers me that there's inequity in in high schools and middle schools and elementary schools across the country where teachers are leaving in droves. They're not quite qualified. They're allowed to be in there because it's a lower performing school. I mean, it's a mess. Why is that even okay? Um, So those are the things that I stand up and say enough about. 
I, I love that. And it's so important. You know, we have, as many countries do, you know, challenges with how our society is functioning. And at the end of the day, so much of it goes back to how are we raising our young people? And I always try to focus on these are our future leaders. These are the people that are going to be making the decisions sooner rather than later because their generation is bigger than our generations. And we're all tired. <laughs> it's been a long pandemic and most of us are ready for a break sooner than probably we would have normally retired. But these people are going to be, you know, pushed into an area where maybe they're not ready to lead. Maybe they can barely figure it out for themselves. And if we haven't given them a good foundation, all of us struggle together. So I think it's really important to keep revisiting uh, education throughout younger, p young kids, high school age, as well as, you know, post-secondary education and stuff. It, there's just so many layers on there. And I really love your book. I would love all the opportunities that you provide for people to help them and their parents think through what they want to do and what's the best option for them. Maybe now, maybe five years from now, even 10 years from now, we can all keep making that decision. We're living a long time now. So yeah, for sure. For sure. <laughs> Uh, awesome. Well, it's been amazing having you on, Stephanie. I can't believe how lo how fast the time flies. But before we go, why don't you let people know where they can find you and anything else exciting coming up that you'd like to share? <laughs> yeah, best place to find me is stephaniehaines.net. Um, that's where you can find all about me, all about the services I offer. You can get a taste for who I am by going to my YouTube channel on YouTube. Just uh, search Stephanie Haynes. I think it's Stephanie Haynes LLC because I don't have 100 subscribers yet. I just launched it. So got to get that name out there. But find me on YouTube and you can find a ton of free content. I literally, I give it all away. Uh, if you would like the book, it's on Amazon or it's on Barnes & Noble. You search College is Not Mandatory. Put in Stephanie Haynes. If you want to follow me on Instagram, it's Ed Coach Steph Haynes. Same with Facebook if you want to do that there. Uh, and that's all, all I'm on because I don't have time to do much else. That's enough. So, you know, I would love to connect with you. Uh, if you have questions, there's always a contact button on my website. You can reach out and ask any questions you want. doesn't matter if you're a millennial trying to figure things out. If you're a parent, you're an educator, you're just someone who happened to catch the podcast, whatever. I would love to hear from you because what you ask is how I learn and how I grow to help others. So whatever you've got, I'd love to hear from you. Fantastic. And we'll include all of that in our show notes and our links on social media. So hopefully as the episode comes out, you guys can tag and follow and learn more about Stephanie and all the wonderful things she's doing. So awesome, guys. Thank you guys so much for a wonderful, wonderful episode. And uh, we will catch you on the next one. You can find our show wherever the cool kids hang out, the do podcast. Bye, guys. For video outtakes of the show, don't forget to catch us on TikTok. You don't stop at Nikki Green 678. The full-length shows are available on all the podcast platforms now, including Amazon Music, Stitcher, and Good Pods. The full video is available on Nikki's YouTube channel, and links to all of our social media, including info about our guests, is available in our show notes. Thanks for listening, and we will see you next week. Bye.